viruses and bacteria. Can those exist in space and how do we study their, their presence and the biology of these uh, very uh, primitive uh, life forms? In space conditions, which is kind of harsh condition because one thing is weightlessness, so there is no gravity, we can say. And how important that is to maintain overall physiological health, not just your sleep and wake up cycle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this biological clock exists even in very primitive bacteria, but for us humans, it is very important for metabolism. If you are in space, your circadian rhythms are lost. Why? Because... Hello and welcome everybody to another exciting episode of SciTalks 2.0. Today I have an amazing guest with us to talk about one of my favorite subjects and topics. I'm sure it is for most of you guys. This is about space, space exploration, and the exciting stuff that goes along with that, including astrobiology, could life survive on space? Well, how does astronauts train to get ready to fly to space? So I have one of the more amazing guests I've had on the show. Uh, who is the foremost expert in all this to talk to us about all these exciting stuff. So um, I will introduce her really briefly and then I will give her a time to talk about herself as well. So I have with me Dr. Agatha Kowajajek with us today uh, to talk to us about uh, all of these exciting stuff. She's a neuroscientist by training and I'm very biased with that because I love the brain and neuroscience myself. She's also an astrobiologist, which means she studies how life processes happen in space. Now that must be the coolest job in the world. So uh, I'll give that quick introduction and then I will leave it up to her to tell us a little bit more about her background and then we'll go on to these exciting topics that she has to tell us. So Dr. Koa Jajek, can you please tell us a little bit about your amazing background and then we'll get started. Yes, uh, hello, thank you very much for invitation and I'm very happy and glad to be with all of you. And uh, well, I think uh, you already mentioned, Jack, uh, most of things, uh, important things with my background and with what I'm doing now. Um, I'm also doing um, analog, uh, analog missions, analog simulations, and I'm a scientific director of research projects in Analog Astronauts Training Center. And I would like to welcome everyone to co collaborate with us. And yeah, I awesome. think it is very interesting for not only me, but many people who work with us. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's exciting to be looking up into space and, and seeing the effort that it takes and the stuff that you guys do as a foundation for us to be able to do these explorations. So, you know, ever since I was a kid, you know, I was always excited about looking up into the sky and into the microscope, the two ends of the, the, the spectrum. So I'm glad that I could finally talk to somebody that allows me to understand what's up in the sky. So without further ado, let's talk about astrobiology and life in space, because that's one of my favorite topics. And with the current pandemic going on, viruses and bacteria. Can those exist in space and how do we study their, their presence and the biology of these uh, very uh, primitive uh, life forms, not bacteria being life forms, but back, uh, uh, not viruses being life forms, but bacteria being life forms. And what about viruses? You know, we're all talking about the pandemic. Can viruses happen in space and how do we study that? Uh, very good question, Jack. I think that this is one of the most interesting questions now in the world. Uh, well, viruses are in space. They are on the ISS, International Space Station, and uh, they are very dangerous for astronauts, actually. So they uh, mostly uh, cause um, digestive system infections, which are very common for astronauts. They also may cause some other diseases, but uh, in total, I must tell you that for 
uh, in the history, we had like 740 astronauts. I'm saying also cosmonauts here and taikonauts. Taikonauts, I, I simply generalized this name, so forgive me. Um, space explorers, everybody who's been in space, right? Yeah, so it, it was like 700 people in space, but only 29 suffered from infections and really uh, like uh, diseases that they were not um, allowing these people to uh, really uh, feel comfortably and doing their job. Uh, so it is not that bad. Yes, 700 and only we have like 29 people uh, sick. But of course, many people, they suffer from these viral infections and uh, when they are back on uh, coming back uh, to the earth, it is seen that in their uh, digestive system probes from their guts, they have much more bacteria. And they, um, for example, herpes virus is far more active than it is normally. So it means that in space conditions, which is kind of harsh condition because one thing is weightlessness. So there is no gravity, we can say. And second thing, which is even more important for biology is radiation, cosmic radiation, because this really affects molecules. This really can change, can modify, for example, virus. And these forms of um, these simple biological forms or bacteria forms of, of life, then may, they may transform, mutate, and they may be even lethal forms. So everything is far more serious and it happens much faster in space than here on the Earth. Very interesting, very interesting. So their gut microflora actually is altered when they're in space. Is that what you're saying? And because we know from medicine and, and biology on Earth that altering the gut mi microflora can have profound effects on various biological processes. So being in space, what you're uh, if I understand correctly, is that the radiation and weightlessness alters their gut microflora? Yes, absolutely. They alter uh, micro gut flora, but also all kinds of bacterial fl um, floras. And also there is experiments all the time ongoing on the ISS uh, revealing how bacteria, they mutate, they transform. So this is very a long-term process that is observed now in space. Uh, actually, there were more than 60 um, more advanced organisms exposed to space uh, environment. When I'm saying to space environment, I mean, um, I mean a Kibo panel, which is outside the door of the International Space Station. So it mm -hmm. is a direct exposition to space conditions. Uh, this means uh, there are fluctuations of temperatures, there are, you know, no pressure, uh, very harsh, uh, of course, cosmic radiation, UV light, all mm. these things exist. And um, there are like uh, 60 microorganisms exposed to uh, these conditions. And of course, scientists kind of see what happens with these forms. And most of them, they survive, which is very interesting. Yeah. Yes. What is also very interesting, I don't know if um, you know that there, uh, there was a mission on the moon. It was Apollo 7 in uh, 1968, where they left the, um, uh, sorry, no, 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 Apollo 7, which it was, Apollo 12, 12 Apollo 12 mission, they, uh, they put a lander, surveyor free, and after two and a half years, they observed that on the camera of this lander, there were still bacteria streptococcus, mitis. When they brought them back to the earth, they were alive. Can you imagine wow. exposition? Two and a half year of bacteria, and they yeah. could survive in space on the moon. So it, it's amazing. It, it, it tells you how, you know, uh, strong life is when put under stresses. It will evolve to adapt to its environment and no, no matter how harsh the conditions are. I mean, this is 
pretty remarkable. So what, what does this tell us about life existing outside of Earth? And the other question that I want to follow up with that is, are we contaminating space with our viruses and bacteria with all of these explorations? And, and uh, th would that have any potential down the turf? I mean, I can't imagine any, but you know it better than I. Any, any consequences? Uh, what I can say for sure, we are um, sort of transporting these molecules um, at high altitudes. Because normally our life exists, do you, can you guess how far we can, what is the altitude, the maximal altitude uh, where life exists like this? I will tell you, it's 40 kilometers only. It's the stratosphere. Wow. Yes, yes, and it is only when we have a thunderstorm, you know, a huge cumulonimbus clouds that, you know, they are, they had these all, um, how to say, all the convections and so on. Currents, they yeah. move all molecules, all dust up um, at high altitudes. So this is 40 kilometers maximum with our life. Normally, it is about uh, 15 kilometers, which is also a um, higher troposphere. So uh, what I can tell you is that, for example, on the rocket uh, that are, of course, uh, transporting everything to space, they observe that, they, um, that there are plasmids, which are, you know, autonomous DNA molecules in cytoplasm. Mm. These plasmids were found on the rocket and these plasmids survived, you know, this was on the surface of the rocket. So these plasmids survived all uh, entry, um, you know, through the atmosphere, all these the heat heating things, in, everything. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. So we see that our <laughs> DNA is amazing and it can survive such a harsh conditions. So mm. definitely we move this matter, we move this molecule up, up to this space, but for example, for viruses, you know, viruses are not uh, really uh, a life forms. This, right. There is always some controversy. Is, is this alive or not? To be um, functionally, you know, um, proliferating, uh, developing, viruses need to have a host. Right. So we should exist in space, then viruses will exist with us. I see. Or some host right. with, with all this machinery that can, you know, recreate virus inside the cell. So virus needs some very intelligent <laughs> organism to, be, to exist out there also, then virus can survive. Of course, it can possibly survive as a molecule and then mm -hmm. wait until there will be this host to multiply. At least the viruses we understand, right? Because there could be some variations to this that is still unknown to humankind in terms of uh, replication of their genomic material. And of course, bacteriophages could, could live on, you know, bacteria. So if there's some kind of bacteria out there, we could definitely maybe expect viruses. Uh, absolutely. I think that bacteriophages, <laughs> they are very common in space. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, um, I don't remember publications, but I know that they found uh, various mutations in bacteria, probably caused by, of course, bacteriophages. Sorry, I don't remember the paper, but definitely bacteriophages exists, exist on the ISS. So one way to cure the pandemic is to put all of us in space and hopefully the viruses won't follow us, right? maybe not to put in space but to bring some lessons out from space for example mm -hmm. how space medicine um, lowers the risk of contamination lowers the risk of, of infection and protects astronauts so first of all we all have it now it's a quarantine of course mm -hmm. to isolate uh, us our body uh, from virus of course it is very difficult <laughs> <laughs> so right. mask is not in the, enough for sure, right. um, but quarantine is one thing. Second is, of course, uh, some basic hygienic procedures and all astronauts, first of all, they have a proper training. They know what to do 
in case of all different kinds of harsh situations. And this is very important that astronauts know procedures and they know sort of most of answers what happens if. Yeah. So it is very good to be prepared for, for these kind of things. And of course, isolation in space is not really isolation because astronauts, they have teleconferences with their families, their relatives every day. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, it is quite important to keep contact, to keep contact with the family, um, to feel that we are not alone not somehow mm. isolated and yeah i think that this is a very good lesson especially for for situation now that we shouldn't really panic oh my god it's so dangerous now i cannot go out from home of course you need to follow some procedures mm -hmm. second you need to know what is the virus what can do for your body what are risks and you mm. can compute this risk so right. I think then you are not having, you know, all these kind of weird fears. That, I mean, that is a great point. We all need to channel our inner astronaut and think like an astronaut. And, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and we will be good. I mean, and these guys go through all that training to be able to, to, to maintain these kinds of situations under, you know, good control without letting their emotions and their fear get to us. And I think that's an amazing lesson for everybody to pay attention to that, you know, uh, the human body and the mind could do it. Astronauts do it, of course, with a lot of training, but, you know, we are all capable of doing this and we should follow those exact same guidelines that you gave. I think that's better than what most doctors are telling people. So I really appreciate that the way you put it. So, um, uh, can we talk about space medicine now? How do we study space medicine and how do we um, uh, approach what space does to the body, right? I mean, that's a loaded question and we could start off from any of your favorite angles of how we study the effects of space on the human body and the various components of the human body. Well, so space medicine, it's a very complex, um, how to say, um, field of study because it is multidisciplinary field of study, first of all. It evolved from aviation medicine, and then of course it developed to space medicine. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the main thing is that it consists on multiple groups of experts. First, of course, medical doctors who are responsible for um for first of all astronaut selection so selecting the proper people to be able to work in space efficiently and then to elaborate procedures how to uh, prevent health in space conditions what kind of uh, methods of yeah of tools used in order to keep astronaut safety um, so medical doctors is one part. Of course, they are doing research. They are on research based on astronauts that are coming back. They, they are all the time monitoring astronaut health uh, using telemedicine, which I really love. Exciting. I'm, I'm very big fan of telemedicine. And uh, later on, of course, when astronauts are back, they are also monitoring their health. They are testing, making research. So this is one group of people. Then there is a group of people who are physiotherapists, who are people, for example, living uh, in Mars 500. And now mm -hmm. they are like a psychologist to help astronauts to prepare properly to the mission, to isolation, to, um, you know, living far from the distance. And of course, they are, um, they are developing rehabilitation programs after astronauts are coming back because they are not the same people <laughs> when they are coming back from space. I will tell you in a moment what, what is the most funny thing for me. Uh, and the last group, of course, are biomedical engineers who are designing and, um, mm -hmm. and producing the proper medical tools, medical equipment, which is, of course, launched on board of ISS. And, and yeah, what, <laughs> what I told you, um, why astronauts are not the same when they are coming back. 
um, from my neuroscientist, you know, uh, point of view, is very uh, interesting thing that happens uh, with your brain. So once you uh, are in space, after a few days, you sometime, somehow adjust to the conditions that there is no up, no down. And astronauts really can fly freely um, in all axes uh, of space, which is very, um, very nice, very fantastic um, impression. But for your brain, uh, it means that it develops completely new synaptic contacts it's to same. somehow cope with this new situation, which is great. Um, and after you coming, after you come back to the Earth, you have gravity. Oh <laughs> and my God. Your brain, your brain already made different, you know, synaptic contacts, reprogrammed a bit. And then I know from uh, Roberta Bondar, uh, who was a neuroscientist astronaut, uh, she told me that she completely lost uh, her reflex to put her hands when, when she, she was falling down. She completely <laughs> didn't have this, you oh know, instinct. God. Yeah, so it's... she had to train that when she falls down, she has to protect her face uh, with her hands. So she has so to it... consciously think about this rather than her exactly. reflex system. Keep... Wow. She had to mm. learn back how to do this <laughs> oh my and some God. astronauts they also say that they um they have to learn back how to walk wow and of course these astronauts who are very long in space sure so it's like a baby they can feel it. i mean it's it, it's amazing that the amount of neuroplasticity and changes that could happen even you know in an adult you know most astronauts are adults and 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 that the brain could rewire itself to fit into its environment that's that's pretty remarkable you know i, I never thought about these things uh and and it's, it's quite interesting that people are studying and looking into this so um how do we train them back to be normal when they get back i mean is there uh like a place they have to continue doing physiotherapy and and reconditioning before they're let out into back to normal life or is there something that they do themselves? Uh, well, of course, they are all the time um, monitored. And first days after the mission, they are um, still in isolation, in quarantine, uh, observed by doctors. And then they have time to get back to the normal space. Uh, in Europe, because this I know, uh, they are in the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, in Germany. So they are there and they are trying to get back normal with everything. Uh, outside of the brain, which is both of our favorite organs, are there any other significant changes that you see uh, in terms of uh, the, the body in general before we talk about some of the psychological aspect and your favorite thing about how time perception is different? I know you're excited to get into that and so am I, but uh, are there any other uh, interesting changes that we've been able to observe in the astronauts when they get back or? Absolutely. Um, I think it is quite uh, well known, maybe not for all, but uh, that in weightlessness, um, we don't need such a heavy skeleton. We don't need so many muscles. Our heart doesn't need to pump blood so heavily. So of course we can observe in a couple of days when we are in space, uh, physiological changes uh, of our body. And later on after physiological changes, which are uh, lifting, for example, of whole fluid up because of no gravity. Uh, so our veins, our, you know, all receptors that keep the circulation in a proper matter in 1G, this system completely has to re-establish uh, new parameters in order to keep person um, able to think because of course the brain the is up to the brain. Yeah. yeah or in space we don't know where it is up or down but uh, yes so first of all there are like functional changes and then these follow morph morphological changes which are um osteo um, how to say porosis. Not, yeah osteoporosis you're right this is english expression 
Thank you. Um, so you lose the bone tissue, you lose the muscle tissue, your organs shrink. Wow. Uh, the only what is not shrinking is a brain, apparently. This is the recent <laughs> discovery. But wow. this is because of fluid, of course, that it is going up. And probably other things we don't know yet. Uh, so there are many morphological changes in our body. This requires that astronauts have to train. Every day they have to train two hours on mm. ISS in order yeah. to keep their body able to get back on Earth and, you know, to not fall down, that mm. the skeleton, these muscles will be too weak. Backbone, because there is no gravity, it, um, it elongates even oh. five centimeters. So wow. astronauts can have the back pain, yes, because it's much longer. Uh, what else? Uh, well, there is, of course, inter intercranial pressure because of fluid. So uh, astronauts may have problems with eyes because of pressure. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, a tension on eyeballs. Um, this may cause um, myopia, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and other, even more, uh, big, even bigger problems. Uh, what else oh my god oh, do they have of... any do they have any changes just out of curiosity in terms of their taste or their their smell or 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 any of these other senses do you know if they have any changes in this sensory perception absolutely thank you for reminding me this uh, they are losing uh, taste and odor and it's because of fluids again they they mm -hmm. still have like a, you know, like a raining nose or like a full nose because of fluid. And because of this fluid, they cannot really perceive um, chemical molecules that are smelling molecules and of course odors because smell is connected right. with odor. Yeah. Interesting. And then, so are there things that they do even before they go to space to kind of um, be extra prepared to, to uh, be, you know, um, ready when these things start to um, happen in a space environment? Absolutely, they train a lot. Uh, for example, in neutral buoyancy. Neutral mm -hmm. buoyancy environment is like an underwater environment and all divers know what I'm saying when I'm saying neutral buoyancy. It's just to keep um, the, this is like a simulation of no gravity. Right. And with your body, with special tools that you have, you can uh, get this kind of state that you are sort of weightlessness in the water. And in this state, um, astronauts, they train many kind of things, works that they have to do later on ISS. So of course they are not 100%, you know, um, they do not know 100% how it will be on ISS, let's the say the first, we could come. Right. yes, but I think that they are very well prepared to, um, in understanding what will happen with their body, um, mm. what they should expect, and they are trained in hyp um, hyperbaric, hyperbaric Hyper chambers, mm -hmm. yes, hyperbaric chambers, so very low pressure chambers, also to uh, see how their body will behave. Training is very important. Also centrifuge with, you know, uh, mm. with all different uh, gravity forces acting on your body. So this, everything is well trained before the mission. So uh, having said all of these changes and um, all of these things that an astronaut needs to go if they want to go to space. Now there's a lot of you know, private companies um, like Elon Musk and a couple of other ones that want to send people to, to, to space. Of course, they're not going to go through these trainings, right? I mean, uh, so how, how would that work? Unless what you're saying is you need to be in space for extensive amount of time for these changes to take place. Well, uh, now all uh, tourist astronauts, because they exist already, uh, they have mm -hmm. to follow the full training same as astronauts so it I is see. more or less two years of training i see a lot a lot i believe i don't know what will happen with uh, future space tourism because this future 
space, uh, how to say, cars, <laughs> yeah. lifting us in space. Taxi cabs, right? Taxi cabs, yes. Uh, they will be far more comfortable. They will be not like nowadays, the Soyuz capsule, which is like, you know, small Mercedes Smart. <laughs> it's very... <laughs> yes, it's, you're squashed in there. It's very like confined space. Uh, so, of course, it will be far more comfortable and develop. The technology will be completely different, a new, new type of technology. And I believe that we might have three days of training and this will be enough. That's that what I'm saying, you know, I'm guessing. So do you think in one day we would be able to simulate some of the earth conditions so that all of these issues will not be as profound on these people like at this as is on astronaut. I know this is sci-fi, you know, when you see like on uh, Star Trek, they're able to simulate gravity. And I've seen some, you know, uh, theoretical uh, models of how we could potentially simulate gravity in outer space. Um, do you think these are possibilities that maybe us or our children might see in their lifetimes? Yes, absolutely. Especially developing of uh, virtual reality uh, environments. This can really help in uh, preparing to such missions. And of course, if you are a space tourist and not a scientist or engineer uh, who has to do the job, you just are coming to see, to explore something, mm -hmm. then you maybe don't need to have very profound training, you know, about all kinds of very complex jobs you need to do in space just mm -hmm. you need to to keep healthy you know yes mm -hmm. exciting yeah. um so let's get to the topic of our, our favorite uh, uh organ in the body and, and of course we're biased and we can be on the show um the brain uh i know we've talked together a little bit about how the brain perceives time and uh it's kind of remarkable it's almost uh something that most people can't imagine that time is something that the brain creates and it's not an object that exists outside of the brain. Um, if I, if I'm correct. And can you tell us how space alters that? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for this question. I was waiting <laughs> a long time. Um, yes, I really uh, love time topic because it's, um, Many people and scientists say that this is only related with us, with humans, that only we can feel the time passing, sort of like we can uh, make decisions based on the past, we can plan based on predictions about the future, and we have this very well developed uh, in many regions, on regions of the brain. Um, there are more or less five regions now uh, of the brain. I won't speak about this because um, I'm not looking at each kind of region that is responsible for our time perception. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm more into biological clock and how biological clock is disturb disturbed in space and how we can uh, sort of uh, make it better because what we know now that when astronauts are in space they completely mm -hmm. lost circadian rhythms mm -hmm. and you know what it means it's yeah can we can we expand this a little bit uh for the yeah. audience about what circadian rhythm is and how important that is to maintain overall physiological health not just your sleep and wake up cycle yeah exactly uh, so this biological clock exists even in very primitive bacteria, but for us humans, it is very important for metabolism, homeostasis, and overall health. So once you are in space, your circadian rhythms are lost. Why? Because, first of all, International Space Station is orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, it means that the, the, the day and night mm. is 90 minutes. So oh. it is very fast. Not 24 hours, but 90 minutes, first of all. Of course, because uh, cupola is not all the time open, astronauts do not see if there is a day outside or night. 
So they are completely not, you know, following this 90 uh, minute rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a problem. The problem on board of spaceship is artificial light. Mm. This artificial light we have also in our houses, in offices, in hospitals, which is also very important tip. Uh, this artificial light is not the same as sunlight. Yes, because mm -hmm. the artificial light, it, only ha it has all UV light cut, first of all, because mm -hmm. of many, you know, restrictions, restrictions, norms, and so on. Uh, so we already lose this kind of very, very uh, big spectrum of light. And of course, infrared is also cut. Mm -hmm. So we have only sort of like a visible light mm -hmm. um, in this artificial lighting. This causes many big problems with our body. First of all, our body is not synthesizing vitamin D. Vitamin yes? D, yes. Yeah. yeah. It is urochaic acid. There are endorphins. Many things, also neurotransmitters like serotonin, is induced by UV light. So all these very important molecules, which are crucial to our health, we lost this possibility that our organisms can synthesize. And then next is that even you, um, you can drive sort of, uh, you know, 12 hours light phase, 12 hours dark phase using this artificial light. But this is, again, not the same as sun Real is light. doing. Yes. Real light, yes. Yeah. And this idea um, pushed me to solve this problem. So to finally invent the lighting system, which will be a sunlight simulator on board of spaceships and on board of habitats on the moon or on Mars, because we cannot be exposed, of course, directly to the sun. There mm -hmm. is no atmosphere, you know, the light is very dangerous, can be dangerous. So we need to design the light that is still safe for our body, but that is doing the stuff, the really necessary stuff to keep us healthy. And that's what we are doing now. And that is why uh, we created uh, habitats, which are simulation bases mm -hmm. uh, in Poland. Um, these are sort of like chronobiological laboratories. Chronobiological means uh, biological clock laboratories. So laboratories to test circadian mm -hmm. rhythms in humans mm -hmm. and biological clock. And we, put people there, analog astronauts, so we call them analog astronauts, we train them um, nearly, we can say similarly to real astronaut training uh, system. And after this, we put them into isolation. Uh, they have their own mission with their own logo, uh, they are monitored by a mission control center, which is outside the habitat. And then we, uh, we test their circadian rhythms during two weeks isolation. Two weeks is enough to test biological clock rhythms and to do some one, two experiments. I think one experiment within these two weeks on circadian clock is, is okay. So we are, what we are doing, we are, first of all, testing different kind of lighting systems, first of all, using different wavelengths and mm. look how biological clock is changing on these people. Mm. Or we are, we are um, putting time shifts to see how their internal biological clock and their internal rhythms how they will adjust to new lighting signals because light is sort of like a, um, the main trigger factor to reset the clock, to make clock, uh, you know, um, ticking from this, uh, like from the new day, let's say. I don't know if I'm clear. 
No, no, yeah. It's like, you know, that grandfather clock that you had to sometimes restart when it stopped swinging. You're kind of pushing that swinging motion exactly. to get it started. Yes. Biological clock, uh, clock is a very nice molecular uh, system full with um, molecular loops mm -hmm. related with each other. So they, they can be driven by external stimuli, external light stimuli, and this light can you know, reset all these molecular loops inside um, our body. And uh, we are uh, doing the experiment with uh, time perception also, based on these all uh, experiments. So our main core experiment is that we have two weeks mission and we divide this two weeks mission into four phases. Phase one is just a normal 24 hours phase, you know, when they are just coming to the mission. Then we have a longer day, which is 26 hours. Then we have shorter day, 22 hours, and then we are back to 24 hours. And using this thing, it is very interesting to see how people are coming into very heavy jet lag. They are very tired, you know, they feel very bad. They cannot perform, they work efficiently. And this is what we uh, very often may observe on board on ISS, that people, mm. they also feel tired, they cannot sleep. Mm, there is very big problem with melatonin. So astronauts, they, they have pills with melatonin, you know, mm -hmm. to regulate melatonin cycles because they have to be artificially modulated. Light is not enough on space. So it's mm -hmm. very interesting topic. So, so you're getting closer to the sun, but yet you're getting less light, which is kind of ironic, right? <laughs> Well, you're right. We have to somehow <clears throat> either use some special windows right. that can screen the sun and to make a really nice, you know, like a skyscraper starship. Right. So instead of trying material. to generate the light, can we, like you're saying, kind of filter out what we don't and allow its normal uh, system to take place? Or would that be more challenging to do because creating such kind of filters is problematic because you're looking at the two extreme ends of the spectrum. Um, we, um, what we are doing, we are trying to, of course, um, how to say, employ this whole idea about simulating the sun spectrum, which is, you know, this is like a constant spectrum. It is not only like a, a single wavelengths are uh, available, mm -hmm. but there is a constant spectrum, uh, the full spectrum of full uh, kinds of wavelengths. And we want to use LED technology, which is uh, very, you know, um, mm. energy saving technology, right. especially in space. So we need to find some kind of lighting system that is very energy saving, and it keeps the crucial wavelengths taken out from the uh, nice. sun spectrum. So we try to find the optimal, you know, this wavelength cocktail of light and yeah. to design the proper LED lighting. Oh, okay. So that way they could have almost, you know, very long lasting light with the exact combination of wavelengths that needed to, to stay alive. Um, so what about time perception, right? Uh, how does...